this conference will now be recorded. Introduce them to you. But let's give few words about the co-hosting programs, namely Panorama and BEST. And I will uh, kindly ask now my colleague, Cécile, to give a few words about the Panorama program. Cécile, please. Thank you, Carole. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. I'm very happy to spend the next hour and a half with you. So as when we are practitioners in the field, um, we have the tendency to, to work sometimes in isolation and we are dealing with challenges of all kinds on a daily basis. Uh, we don't have much time sometimes to explore if there are solutions around or we find difficult as well to, to communicate about our own good practices. So we can be in two situations, either we are looking for a solution or we are willing to share and communicate about it. And either way, the Panorama Initiative can support you. Next, Carol. So who is behind it? It's a partnership of seven organizations, and GIZ, IUCN are playing the role of the Secretariat. And we have as funders the uh, uh, Ministry of Environment of Germany and GEF. And the Panorama Initiatives have, covers seven main challenges, uh, among which the protected areas and marine and coastal. So what is it exactly that we talk about? First, it's an online website, free access, where you can find a solution. So it's kind of a library of good practices. Second is also a live exchange. So we can facilitate exchange visits or workshop to identify uh, each other's good practices. And it can be also webinars like today. And finally, it's also a communication channel where we promote the solutions that are usually found on the Panorama platform. So how does it work? Uh, it, it supports knowledge exchange mechanisms that, are, that, are, that take place between solution providers and solution seekers. So we we, we try to connect people who can exchange on their good practices for future collaboration. And usually we have a given format, which is a bit the panorama signature. So it's a format where, our, where the success factors of each solution are um, identified and highlighted by the solution providers, so the practitioners and then uh, the impacts, the tangible results of the solutions are also uh, written down in a section. So the idea of having this format is to enhance the share, the, it, to make it easier to share. So if you are a solution seeker, then you would go on the Panorama platform or you would visit an event and you would, you would see uh, what are these solutions, um, what makes this solution work and maybe some of the, part of the solutions can also work in your own uh, area. So um, that's the, really the idea of Panorama and then also to foster some uh, replication. So if a good practices is done somewhere, no need to reinvent the wheel and maybe there is a way to adapt and uh, implement in our own context. So next. What's in there for you? So if you go uh, on the Panorama platform, uh, currently you will find around 600 solution uh, case studies. And there are more than 1,500 success factors uh, and more or less 500 solution providers. So it's already a lot, but I'm sure that uh, we could get many more from you from the Pacific as well. They are already from the Pacific, bien sûr. Um, all solutions have an impact, they are scalable, and they address conservation and development challenges in an integrated manner. 
So what are we going to do today? So this uh, simple schema is to illustrate that we will have four speakers, Leticia, Roland, Caroline and Kate, and they will tell us about their experiences, their good practices, and exchange knowledge, knowledge among themselves. And who knows, maybe uh, they'll find ways to collaborate in the future. That's what we hope for them. So I'm looking forward for the discussion. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cécile. As indicated, this uh, online event is as well co-hosted by BEST. It is a European initiative to foster action in seven regions of global importance, and they are aiming at supporting all the European overseas. They represent 34 political entities located in every ocean of the world, and altogether they represent the largest marine domain of the world. So in this regard, um, BEST is a European initiative of international importance because of its recipients, its beneficiaries that are globally important and acknowledged as hosting global hotspots of biodiversity or being part of those hotspots. And this is why the Convention on Biological Diversity acknowledged BEST as a sustainable financing mechanism and BEST has been as well kindly acknowledged by the Global Island Partnership, GLISPA, as a bright spot. But what's in the DNA of BEST? Actually, it's a partnership. Since the very beginning, the European Parliament worked hand in hand with the European Commission for setting up a proprietary action. And here I would like to acknowledge the important role of Mr. Ponga, who is in New Caledonia who has been highly instrumental for this great initiative to happen. BEST is actually supported by several donors, the European Commission through the B4Life program funded by DG DEFCO, through the LIFE program funded by DG ANF, but as well by the French Office for Biodiversity and the French Agency for Development. It's a pilot initiative with a wide scope in order to enable stakeholders in all these territories to define themselves the project that makes sense for addressing their needs. So it's really aiming at enabling local stakeholders to address their environmental and sustainable challenges. To date, BEST has funded 61 projects, and this represents an overall investment of 8 million, and through that, 72 organization, local organization have been funded. BES has funded uh, that way many and very diverse projects, including 32 marine projects. And in the Pacific, this represents an investment for 24 projects and all the territories have benefited from this action. Among these 24 projects, six are dealing with marine issues through medium grant projects and small grant projects. So thanks to BEST, um, awakening vocation, involving, raising awareness, collaborating with local authorities, but as well building capacity. And here I would like to, to give a big thank you and to acknowledge the, the important work of uh, Elena, Elena Gorshakova and Jean Capé. Thank you again for, for your support for the BEST program and your hard work. So you can see BEST is not only actually providing an easier access to funding opportunity, but as well supporting the local stakeholders. But the journey is not over. We are very happy to tell you that this year we will launch a new call for proposal. So please visit our, our website, stay tuned. And um, this uh, new call will aim definitely to deploy and to support new activities on the ground. So without further ado, let's see one of the 
best project implemented in the Pacific and more specifically in French Polynesia. And I will uh, call now Leticia Bissara and Roland Fanker in order to present this best project. Leticia is an engineer. She specialized in environment. She's a project officer for FAPE de Oranao. She has been managing for the, the FAPE, the best project on educational marine managerial. And she has been supporting schools and teachers for joining this network of labelized uh, educational marine managerial. She has been, she is coordinating and she has put in place as well the monitoring network of mangrove in French Polynesia. And she's coordinating training of local environmental NGOs. And this in close collaboration with the local stakeholders, the municipalities, on project management and sustainable development. Roland Sanquer is a, a teacher and is in charge for the French Polynesia Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport, of Environmental Education and Sustainable Development. So please, Laetitia and Roland, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you for hosting us today. I will let my colleague uh, talk first, Roland, if you want to start. Yes, uh, good evening or good morning. Uh, like in introduction, uh, I'm in charge for the network of uh, EMA in French Polynesia. So I arrive on the year of 2016 and since then uh, I managed the program and I tried to develop it and uh, working for this extension since um, not to become a global network maybe one day. Yeah? So like you you know uh, the EMA born in Marquesas Island and now in French Polynesia in uh, 2000, um, 2020 we have um, uh, 26 uh, schools and middle schools uh, in the program of, of EMA. So the EMA is something uh, born from the criteria of the MPAs with uh, uh, a space with uh, his limits and uh, a council, a managed council and uh, a plan, management plan for for the year. So in, in the in the classroom, we create we create this uh, protocol. We say and uh, try to work with children in their um, behavior, um, how to become a, a person interested and informed about what uh, what happened in the in the ocean and why. Uh, not only protect the ocean, but on also manage the the lagoon or the space uh, front of the school. They they can give ideas and they can help the community to to manage the the area. Uh, in the EMA, we have three pillars. So educa education pillars like knowing the sea, experiencing the sea, and sharing the sea. It, it, uh, it gives to the teachers a new way of teaching and for the kids a new way to give sense of what they are learning and the skills to, to develop. Um, it's something uh, since 2016, the French Polynesia government tried to make standards to, to help schools to create their EMA. So every year we have, um, we say over here, a committee, commit, um, a council who uh, labelize the schools. So every year schools have to give back uh, their activities to that council and and we decide to to give them the label or not. It's really, as you say, not strict but uh, organized. So, like I say, um, we have this year, 2020, uh, 26 primary school and middle schools involved in the EMA program. So we can count 
1,350 student manager. Maybe, uh, Leticia, you can yes. uh, do this part. So, as Roland was saying, we have more than 1,000 students as EMA managers. And just for you to know, uh, the EMAs are mostly located in Marquesas and Society Island for now, but we also have uh, one of them in uh, Tuamotu. So we are covering, which we are trying to cover the, all the archipelagos of Polynesia, just for you to know. And here you have uh, on the presentation um, the assessment results. Actually, in the EMA program, uh, marine ecological assessments are one of the mandatory criteria to, to obtain the label. It is a, it is a must-have and they are conducted by marine biologists. So here you have some examples of what scientists shows to, to, to the EMA students uh, with uh, fish species counts, uh, substrate nature, for example, whether we have more sand or living or dead corals, works, etc. And these are the results of the assessments. We are trying to make the link with uh, mathematics uh, bi and biology programs uh, and between them, between mathematics and biology programs and the EMA concrete cases, because EMA is, for, is first of all a teaching tool. So it's very important for us uh, that uh, students make the link between what they study in class and what they see on the ground, on ground field in the lagoon, for example. Roland, if you would like to continue. Uh, this presentation is uh, to show us the, the start of the global network, because we have uh, at the bottom our president, Edward Fitch, who, who was signed um, a sort of, a, how do you say, a convention, um, uh, a partnership with the French government, Ségolène Royal, at the COP. 21 in Paris on 2015. So now we can say that the uh, the AIMA uh, is de is de are developed uh, in the in the whole world. Eh? We can say that because uh, not only in French Polynesia, but we have AIMA uh, on the French territory and on French department to like Guadeloupe, Réunion, and uh, Martinique. So now we, we can say that uh, it's a really a global network and maybe one day we can uh, uh, extend it, it in uh, other countries. The results, uh, Leticia, you can, you can talk about the, the results too. Like uh, you can see in the photos, uh, we can make sense, we can give sense to to uh, the knowledge we we teach at school and uh, the student. Yes, there there is an active involvement of local stakeholder in the EMA, scientists, marine managers, cities, etc. So it's a really a transdisciplinarity uh, mode of uh, teaching. And most of all, the pupils are totally involved in the project and they are discovering and preserving the EMA and they really want to continue. What I forgot to say is that uh, what is the role, what was the role of Teoranaho uh, in all of that? So Teoranaho, as uh, Carol mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, is the Federation of Environmental Protection Association, Associations, and it was created in, created in 1989. So we have uh, 35 member organizations. And uh, in, in uh, 2018, the Federation received the funding from the European Union with the uh, best program support. Uh, to conduct uh, several ecological assessments in uh, five Polynesian schools. So most of the funding were uh, allocating 
to these ecological assessments because they are very expensive. And as a result, we, we find that uh, students are very connected to their environment, to their marine uh, educative area because we are teaching them what we have assessed on their area and all of that is very important for them to know and to get inv involved in, in this project. So on the, si on the slide you can see uh, uh, pupils collecting data on marine litter or on ev invasive uh, species. So yeah, it's just an uh, illustration. So thank you for uh, your attention. And if you have any questions, we are here to answer and to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Roland and Leticia Baruru. Um, as I indicated, we will open now the, the discussion for a few questions. Uh, Luca, could you please uh, track some questions and ask a participant to ask their question? The, there Hello, is everyone. just yes. Yeah, sorry, Leticia. So far, there is there are no questions on the on the chat. So maybe Cecile, you might have one uh, from the panorama's perspective. Yes, I have one. Um, you said that you have already replicated this model in La Réunion or in Martinique as well. And I wanted, and you would like to expand to other countries as well. And my question is, uh, what would you advise to other practitioners who would like to implement EMMA? What do they need to have to make sure that it's also a success like it is in French Polynesia? Okay, I think we've lost uh, Roland. <laughs> he's not having connection and he's more able to answer this question. So maybe Leticia, you could share your, your own experience since you have been managing this uh, best project. Uh, what was your, your main lesson learned about this experience, about uh, this very nice and innovative idea of uh, having a, a kind of both interdisciplinary but as well I would say intergeneration approach of marine stewardship. Yes, actually it was a great experience in 2018 for me because I was um, a, the coordinator of the of best program uh, for EME in, uh, in Tahiti. And as well, I was um, I was in the class with the students and taking students uh, to the lagoon, and I was uh, the, anima the, the animator. So I I I, I have the both uh, hat cap. Um, it was very interesting because it is first of all a teaching tool, but we are simulating for the students uh, the same um, way of managing an MPA, a marine protected area. We are, conduct we are conducting them uh, toward this uh, path so that can really be in the real situation. So it's a very con concrete project. And yeah, it's, I, I really insist on the fact that it's a teaching tool, first of all, it's not, um, how do we say, uh, leg, uh, legal? Mm -hmm. It's not a legal uh, area. It's... Ah, Roland, you're back. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have uh, no connection. No more connection. <laughs> you, you didn't hear the back. question of Cecile? No. No, uh, but maybe if I, to... if I may, since we we already have three yeah, we new have questions. To... Yes, sorry, Cecile. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, we have already two... three new questions, so maybe you can answer them. Uh, one is um, whether it's uh, the school program is mainly connecting children with the environment, or is there also other aspects such as with fisheries, fishers and gleaners? 
Um, and a related question is, uh, what is the, the big difference between an MI and other type of, uh, of MMA? And uh, what is like a game changer? And uh, related to this is also whether it has been expanded to other islands in the Pacific. Sorry, it's a lot Thanks of questions. You see the, the huge interest. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I, if oh. I can, I, I try to explain because um, uh, it, it's true that in, in French Polynesia, it, it is the Ministry of Education who manage the program. In France, we have the OFB, uh, BioCity French Office. Uh, so it's different because we, we are in the uh, uh, teaching tools. Uh, in French Polynesia, we make the promotion of our regional languages. So other aspect is really the, the cultural aspect. And over here, we, we like in the Pacific Ocean, maybe in Samoa and Tonga and others like Vanuatu, or Fiji, um, the the link between the nature and the nature and the culture, we you you cannot uh, dissociate, mm -hmm. you cannot separate. And at school, this is our way of um, how do you say um, <laughs> uh, our our con conduct conductor. It's our mm -hmm. conductor link because. Uh, uh, when, when you are a teacher, you have to, to, cheat, to teach the languages, the math, the geography, the history, the, uh, the sports too. Huh? So to help teachers to make educational and uh, pedagogical programs, uh, the AIMA is a really, really good uh, support. Like over here, we try to, to work in, for the river too, and we try to work with the... Um, how do you say gardens uh, at school? Every each school over here in French Polynesia, we have a, a garden uh, in the school. So we develop many many educational program with um, how how you how you how you live, how you eat, uh, how you walk. <laughs> uh, see, this is the link in, for our um, skills. Uh, scholars, scholarship skills. I don't know how to say it in English. Huh? The program. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and first, uh, what we don't we don't want that the kids. Um, um, you say um, will be instrumentalized for for the promotion or of the protection of, of uh, area, protected area or something like this. That's why we insist in the word manage, manage area. Give uh, idea to help the community, the mayor or the association to, to, uh, to manage the area they, they, they choose to, to manage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I, I answered sure. the question. Thank you, thank you, Roland. Maybe I could Maybe ask, a last uh, question, okay. Carol. Okay, you have still a question. I don't see you with uh, since I'm sharing my screen. Sorry, I don't see the other question. Please go ahead. <laughs> no, no worries. And um, I will read it again uh, to uh, to ease the process. A question from uh, Brice Bray um, for Roland, maybe as well, is whether the communities with Emma uh, are then more uh, un uh, unified around this uh, this program and the marine resources. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, the fact of now in 2020 is that the, the community, the, the society, uh, the politicals, the, the scientists, they, they know about EMA and they know what, in, in French Polynesia, huh? they know what the, the, the program is about. So uh, for now, we have uh, many partners who want to to work with children uh, on the on the on the team, on the marine area and on the uh, environment environment subject, and uh, this is uh, this is a victory, yeah? I, mm. I think, yeah? because uh, now um, you can say that you don't know it. <laughs> so I don't know if I answered the question, but there's uh, now um, consciousness. Uh, in prise de conscience, something like this, 
the of the the role of, of the children to to give idea to how they want to to improve or how they want to their uh, uh, environment progress they they can help they can help they can give their their ideas so yeah. this is a victory yeah? definitely Lucas, <laughs> do we have more questions Is this the question? Is, is, is this the question? I don't know if I answered the question. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for now, we we hope to really we we work with the French government to depose um, the 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 trademark of uh, mm -hmm. AIMA, uh, and it will help us to extend the 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 network. Sure. And uh, maybe at the Congress, you you send Congress uh, at Marseille on January. Maybe we we can see how uh, we can extend the the, the 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 network. That would be awesome, actually. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's very very inspiring. Maybe I, I can I could ask uh, Kate uh, to to give a a, a thought or insight. Uh, since she is uh, very close and from the, the Pacific, it would be interesting to, to hear from Kate Brown, the Executive Director of the Global Island Partnership. Yes, I just got my nephew who's been dropped off by his mum and now he's basically lying on top of me. Uh, yeah, this is really um, fascinating. I've just moved back from um, Washington DC to uh, New Zealand, so I'm living in a um, in my um, where I come from and where my iwi comes from, and I would like to see how we could do something like this um, here because I think uh, there's been a disconnection in that younger generation between kind of what we used to do in interaction and the kind of a um, role in looking after our marine environment to kind of more of a separation because of our kind of um, colonial history and other various issues. So I'd be really interested to see how we could um, get, get involved um, and do things like this. And I think, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a tremendous um, program. I don't see, I mean, I see lots of these different different types of things um, across the world in different islands, but not something um, so focused as this. So I really um, just appreciated that presentation and um, I'm really keen to learn more. So thank you for that. Thank you, Kate. So here there is already a, a beginning of connection. <laughs> so I, I suggest that um, we investigate another, another very interesting uh, marine solution in the Pacific. And I will uh, call now Caroline Vieux. Caroline is currently coordinating the locally managed marine area network more known under the name of uh, LMMA Network. She managed a community-based coastal fisheries management component that is implemented by the LMMA Network as part of the PERM program. Uh, she formerly co coordinated uh, one other European project, the ENTEC project in French Polynesia, and she was in charge of the coral reef management for SPREP and coordinating the coral reef monitoring network Polynesia Mana, and she's also the new Pacific focal point for the best uh, 2.0 plus uh, program. So please, Caroline, could you please um, take the floor now and present uh, your activities? Yes. Yeah. Good morning. Good evening. You hear me well? Okay. Great. Um, so I will be presenting on what the LMMA network called the 100% solution. Um, first, um, to just talk a bit on the LMMA network, it's a network um, with communities, practitioners, government representatives that formed in 2001 around the vision of a vibrant, resilient and empowered communities. 
who manages sustainably their resources and ecosystems. There's currently around 1,000 of locally managed marine areas in the Pacific region, and those marine areas have spread in other regions as well, and notably in Madagascar, where the uh, network of marine managed area is quite developed there. So I will be presenting some elements of this 100% solution here, uh, those especially contributing to significantly scale up resource management in the region. And I'll be presenting on elements that the LMMA network is currently implementing as part of this uh, program that uh, Carol just mentioned. So to sum up, the 100% solution aims for implementing uh, community-based fisheries management at large scale, covering most coastal waters. So this is a game changer when we know that most of uh, management and conservation is uh, focused on sites more than on large areas, especially when we talk about coastal waters. The 100% solution also takes into account that coastal communities depend both on land and sea resources. So we need integrated approach. 100% solution is 100% of the area, both land, the sea, the river, but also all themes and activity that would impact the, the marine areas. Um, this solution is implemented following the principle of good governance. We need to ensure that communities are respected and that their interests are foremost. To sum up, we could say that the 100% solution would be 100% LMAs, locally managed marine area. So what is the context between the, you know, this, um, behind this solution? Well, we know in the Pacific that the coastal areas and inshore fisheries are most vulnerable to develop impacts of a fishing climate change disaster. We know that made the majority of communities, they heavily depend on coastal resources and that a collapse of these resources would have significant social impacts on people. But also, you know, in the past 20 to 30 years, communities have demonstrated that they can drive local management. Next, please. However, the majority of those communities, they are not supported. Around 90% of Pacific communities are not, have not received support for community-based management. And most of the support is provided by NGOs on short-term projects. One key element is that Pacific uh, Island governments usually underinvest in coastal fisheries management. And this is explained by the graph that you can see. Um, in blue, you have the coastal fisheries and in red, uh, oceanic fisheries. So although coastal fisheries really contribute to nutrition, we see that they don't contribute too much to government revenue, and then the government does not invest in this area that much. Next, please. So when we say the 100% solution would be 100% LMMA, so what is an LMMA? So um, a locally managed marine area is a marine area that's under some form of community-based management, whether it's co-management, or co-management with government and or NGOs. Um, LMMAs usually comes with rights, whether they're traditional rights, and sometimes those rights um, can get the community to exclude outside fishers, for example. But uh, most of the time, those rights are granted by the government and then allow for community to manage their area. In a LMMA, you have different management tools. So you will see um, in, the, in the picture there that you can have permanent reserve, you can have temporary reserve, you can have species restriction, you can have gear restriction, but also you can have measures that will look at, for example, agriculture, disaster preparedness. So in a sense, an LMMA is an integrated coastal management tool. Yeah, next, please. So what's the 100% solution at work? Well, the first part is really to strengthen this LMA tool. 
So the first part would be to design some appropriate information for communities to plan for and implement integrated management themselves. It's, it's really key that communities need to be empowered through information so they can manage themselves and they don't have to wait for external assistance. So you can see on this slide some picture of a tool that was developed in Fiji called the Waka2 flip charts. So the idea is to create some productive discussions within the communities based on these flip charts. Um, and so they're going to allow for discussion on the health of um, the natural resources and the possible ways to manage them. And they include some key messages and background information for the community to share and discuss. We also need to develop some effective communication channels between communities and government because the idea is to improve uh, you know, the legislation and the support to LMAs. So, for example, uh, we are working on um, um, facilitating multi-stakeholder group where communities, government, NGO get to talk to each other, get to know what are the, their issues, what are the solutions that can be proposed by communities. And the, it's also key to develop cost-effective approach to allow for replication. Next, please. Another tool that was developed, for example, is the, we talk a lot about alternative livelihoods, supplementary livelihoods. Um, and the idea here is to help the communities to assess their livelihood option themselves without external assistance as well. So here, you know, you have an idea that you wish to test, and then this manual will guide you through all the questions you need to ask and all the information that's required for you to develop these livelihoods. Next, please. So another um, element of this 100% solution, so when you have a strong LMA tool, then you have to spread it to achieve, you know, what in the, this 100% management of coastal waters. So once you have your information, your really nice tool that you've developed to help communities, then you need to disseminate widely this information and also this incentive for management. And this can be done through social, me social media and national campaigns. You see here on the slide, the four Fiji campaign that was implemented in Fiji on the ban of uh, grouper um, fish and consumption during the spawning aggregation. It's been a highly successful campaign all across the country. You can also use art. You also see here the Twismo spin play from the, the, hot, the theater group in uh, Vanuatu called One Small Bag. So they do play and they present it across the country. And this one was on, um, on marine resource management. It's also important to develop community networks so communities can exchange on you know, best practices, incentive between each other without having same external experts or NGO or government coming and trying to convince communities. Next, please. It's also key that um, even if we say that community needs to be self-sufficient in terms of um, resource management, still you need some support from government. And the idea is really to develop some effective support from government. And we are currently working on developing, implementing some scaling up strategies for government. And these include information strategies. It's also important to train community champions who can, you know, through the community networks, can train uh, other communities. It's also important to increase capacities of fisheries department. Um, as we saw that government tend to underinvest in coastal fisheries, but it's, it's really important. I mean, we won't achieve 100% if you still have just one community-based fisheries management officer within a fisheries department for a whole country. So it's really important to increase this capacity and also develop some cross-sectoral collaboration as we see the 100% solution is highly linked to um, integrated coastal management. 
So if you develop this solution, then you can have, you know, here an image of an island that would be fully managed. And you can see here that you have the whole area managed, but what's really important as well is that we don't mean that 100% conservation, not 100% reserve. You will see here that the reserve are just, you know, in red. So it's, it's just one part of the management. You have various tools. Yeah, next please. So what's the impact of this solution? Um, as I said, you know, we are currently implementing it. But it's really the intended impact is to really sustain the territories of life, you know, sustain like the resource, um, land and sea resource. So people can actually live in those territories. But it also um, contributes to achieving global targets because we can see that, you know, you have also some reserve that are created under this management regime and it contributes to um, you know, targets such as, you know, 10% of uh, protected area in coastal waters, but it also contribute to achieve targets of the sustainable development goals and especially uh, the SDG 14 on sustainable um, coastal resources and fisheries. Yeah, next please. So what, what are the lessons learned? Um, you know, as I said, we are currently implementing the solution. Um, concretely in Fiji, Solomons, Vanuatu, and Papua New Guinea, we are developing a learning strategy. So it's really the learning is in progress and we'll be sharing the first learning of uh, the implementation of this solution during the LMMA conference that was supposed to happen uh, later this year, but that will be postponed to late uh, 2021. And uh, we'll be happy to share, you know, the learning of, of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, for this uh, very as well inspiring uh, network. I, I see that there, there is a huge potential for connection between the educational marine manager area and, and this uh, LMMA network. But I would like first to open the floor and to let Luca to maybe to bring some question up. Yes, so we already have a dozen, half a dozen questions. So maybe the most straightforward to start with, Caroline, you have mentioned uh, the countries you are working with. Um, will uh, LMMA uh, uh, be implemented in, um, in New Caledonia as well? This was the first question. Um, most of the others were more technical of uh, what kind of tools are available uh, through your websites and uh, and um, and the interest. Um, yeah, sorry, I lost my words. I will maybe ask uh, Kate uh, to ask her questions herself uh, when she will take the floor, and we can start like this. Okay, so I will um, so start with the first question on the on New Caledonia. So currently, the project we're implementing as part of the PIOMP is for um, independent countries. So it's only those uh, four countries at the moment. But um, we are always making link. I mean, the LMM network has always made link with the French territories. And so if there's any interest, um, you know, there's my email here and we'll be happy to share. You know, there's no issue with, you know, sharing our tools and sharing the experience. The only thing at the moment we can't share with New Caledonia is the funds associated to this project. And maybe before, before moving to, to Kate, one very interesting uh, question from Christina is uh, whether you have example of, of solutions which have turned into changes of legislation. Well, that's the, I mean, that's what we are working on so far, but um, but I think there's been um, there's been um, quite a lot of uh, uh, legislation uh, empowering communities um, in the region in these past years. So it's not like linked to you know this specific project, but uh, we know, for example, you know in Samoa about the bylaws where. Uh, the government recon recognizes the, um, the, the local laws um, decided by communities. So there's a lot of examples in the region 
where you know the management measures decided by communities are recognized by governments. Thank you, Caroline. Lucai, there are uh, other questions? You mentioned that was dozens. <laughs> yeah, there was one on the if the tools were available. So at the moment, we are reworking really on our website, um, but most of those tools will be available really soon. And um, as you know, we are only starting the Peon project. Uh, many tools will be developed in the next, let's say, in the next two years. So they'll be available from the LMMA website. Thank you. And maybe a last uh, remark, comment, uh, question from uh, from the from the chat is um, it might be too early, but it would be indeed uh, as mm -hmm. uh, Ken Kassem mentioned, very interesting to to see whether you have um, you can compare and see a difference of uh, resilience between. Um, the LMMA uh, uh, areas and uh, the LMMAs and the more governmental-led uh, uh, MPAs in this time of crisis. I don't know if you could already react to this. Uh, well, what we see, because uh, at the moment the LMMA network is also um, involved in uh, implementing um, survey on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on uh, communities. And it's, it's quite interesting to see that um, most of the management measures that were set up by communities um, have not been lifted during the crisis, meaning that communities still believe that, you know, having a reserve or fisheries management measure is the best way to sustain resources, even in the period of the COVID-19. So they haven't lifted I mean, most of the reserves have not been lifted or any bans. So I think it's, it shows some kind of resilience already. Good. Maybe I will just kindly invite uh, Roland and Laetitia maybe to share their thought, um, maybe between uh, and among the network. Could you foresee further collaboration, for instance, in order to connect the dots? I'm afraid we have lost our French Polynesia friends. Sorry about that. <laughs> No, no, we are here. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we I are here. <laughs> yes. Of course, there are many ways to collaborate. And again, I'm waiting Roland to <laughs> give his advice on that because I'm more on the technical uh, domain than... Well, maybe what I can, I could uh, maybe step in and um, so we are, we've, um, you know, we have been discussing with the French Polynesia, but more the fisheries department, because French Polynesia is currently looking at developing a network of their um, marine managed area, um, what they call their special fishing area. Um, and so there was supposed to have a meeting this year to try to see how they would develop the network and they had uh, planned to invite the LMMA network to share their experience. So I think it would be in really interesting while, um, you know, French Polynesia is developing this fisheries management area network to see how they can make connection with the EMA project as well. Great. So I suggest that uh, we we move to um, our next uh, speakers, and Kate Brown. She is the executive director of the Global Island Partnership, that is a platform that enables uh, island leaders and their supporters to take action to build a resilience and sustainable island communities. Kate is definitely a passionate uh, advocate for islands, and she is originally from New Zealand. 
and she lived for eight years in Apia in Samoa. So Kate, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, um, Carol. And it's really great to be on a panel with um, Carolyn because we used to share an office space years ago, like way a longer time ago, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, I've been um, actually living outside of the region for quite a long time and it's quite interesting um, to have that perspective, I think. Um, I'm really interested and I asked a lot of questions on the LMMA um, side of things, which I can touch on um, or just follow up with Carolyn since I do have her email. Um, but I think uh, it's really concerning that there's still the disconnection between kind of the resourcing side um, and the prioritization by governments and kind of what's going on at the community level. Um, and we, it's different, it, it varies in different countries, I think, um, but it'd be really interesting to kind of work together to think about how to um, reconnect those two spaces. In our partnership, which is the Global Island Partnership, we were founded by um, two presidents with the idea of trying to help islands to work together um, on these kind of conservation issues and sustainability. And we've been in existence since about 2006. We work a lot with, um, we work a lot with governments, um, but we have a really wide mix of members. Um, we have about 45 members and 50 friend organizations. A lot of um, organizations work with us because they are trying to make that connection between the global level and um, kind of their potential to um, share and encourage um, more action and what's going on at a very local level. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those examples and some of them are um, kind of a lot different than I think what uh, Caroline was talking about, but I think they're still relevant because all of them um, are connected in some way. And I think, um, I think that's really important. Um, and in, um, the Global Island Partnership, we really focus on the high level political will um, mobilization. So I think this is where we would have a lot of experience. I think we can share with LMMA on that. Um, and then trying to look at how we build and strengthen partnerships that implement these global conservation and sustainability goals on islands. And then finally, this more strategizing about how to bring global attention to and support for these island solutions and initiatives. And I think all of uh, what we've heard are, are fantastic and I really commit myself to sharing them where we can. Um, I really wanted to make though I think um, three main points and then I'll just talk to some of um, what our members are doing um, in the Pacific with some examples but the key that we have um, that I believe is that the focus on locally and culturally appropriate is fundamental. Um, and I think we heard, um, and, and locally driven, driven by the people in the places themselves. And so I think one of the things, if we think about the Pacific, um, we've been innovating and adapting um, our efforts for more than a thousand years. And I think this is, we really need to kind of appreciate that um, and not, sort of always look to others for um, these solutions and really see how we can share some of these. And we heard examples of that earlier. And all of these initiatives are really driven from the bottom up and all of them are in context with the local situation and what island communities themselves want to achieve. I think, um, secondly, it's really critical for islands to network with each other and exchange knowledge, whether that's in not just islands, but actually island communities, even those involved here. And you can see, you know, in the strength of the LMMA network and the potential with EMMA, um, that there's real effort to learn from each other. And I could see that working in lots of island communities across the world. Um, and then really on the sharing experience, developing technical cooperation and maybe joint projects and activities. So there's a lot of um, things in that. Uh, and it really allows us to see initiatives that have been implemented around the world and in our region to see what works and what hasn't worked. And I think we really need to be honest about that. Um, and I think this is where uh, it was really great to hear the LMMA presentation because I um, was kind of able to um, see that in my previous work experience in the Pacific. And it seems to have really um, evolved. That's really great. Um, 
And then we can start to see like the similarities and differences and to potentially um, replicate if it's appropriate or um, islands themselves can decide how and what they can build on and improve. And, and that's basically our history, right? As, as island people, we've been adapting, improving, taking what works um, and making it work for us. So I think that's really the space I like to think that we come from. And then I think um, it's more this kind of local global message, which is that even a single site-based, community-based activity, it can be really transformative. And I think they're real building blocks to something. Um, we see more sites will take part in the island and then we enable, more islands can be enabled to do things in their own context. And this can actually influence both the national attention, regional attention, global attention and support. And really we need to do that so we make sure that the needs of island people are better reflected in these national and global policy and funding priorities. Otherwise, um, a couple of people will decide that for the world and I think that's inappropriate. Um, and so the question is how to better align the effort at community level to the national and international priorities so that those are reflected upwards, not um, the priorities reflected down. And I think those are kind of the fundamental and um, things. And I think um, one of the, um, so I'm going to just show you some of the th uh, things that we work with, uh, not things, <laughs> some of what our members are doing to give some uh, context to what I've just been talking about. Um, if we just move slides, um, we're very into the idea of bright spots, which is um, things that are working potentially. So I, this is a very old bright spot. Um, and the reason I've talked about this is because I want to talk about some other challenges, and this is kind of the, one of the older um, challenges. But a challenge is um, a political leadership challenge. The Micronesia Challenge was developed um, in 2006, and actually it's coming to its end point this year, um, and they're developing a Micronesia Challenge um, Plus, what the next you know 10 years they haven't um, is going to look like. But this is kind of connecting protected areas across three countries to the political leadership. And I think um, it's uniquely um, uniquely suited to Micronesia in terms of what is being done. But the idea of that linkage is being adopted by other countries. And so you see um, that. And I think really the Micronesia challenge exists because Fiji did something before this on um, its, um, I think linked with LMMA actually, uh, and created a um, political commitment that was linked to work that was being done at community level and announced it internationally. And it kind of pushed Micronesia to think about how to rethink their, what they were doing locally and how it can be better reflected uh, internationally. And so this is kind of where this came from. If we look at the next slide, um, we move away from thinking of um, each of these small things as um, as tiny uh, pieces, but this is a huge part of the world um, is the Micronesia challenge. If we move to the next slide, I want to. Um, so all of these countries are members or um, engage with GLISPA, and same with the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. Even though um, that kind of grew out of their efforts with their um, protected areas um, and the approach that Palau has taken to that. Uh, but I think the interesting thing here is that they've developed other tools that help with um, their local management through things like the Palau Pledge, which is trying to better manage the impact of tourism on, um, on the islands of Palau, and which is actually a globally um, significant and is being replicated in other countries. Um, that was driven by the um, by people in Palau. And so I think you start to see um, kind of this local solutions to really difficult problems, um, like re people, um, they were having a major problem with tourists. So it's starting to change uh, that behavior. And I encourage people um, to Google the Palau Pledge because you'll find it's incredibly interesting um, approach and is being um, adopted in some other places. Uh, if we move on from here, that's the, that's the Palau uh, National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and the next slide. Um, so 
we also have, so we're on a, we are talking about some best funded um, activities here in this um, webinar, but best, um, the, we uh, in 2016 recognized this kind of um, approach of best and uh, created something called the best challenge, which is linked to the Micronesia challenge, which is linked to the Caribbean challenge, these big um, initiatives trying to make the linkages between local level action, national government um, engagement, which I think we've just heard is really critical and the international level. Um, and if we move on, um, and so we really welcome BEST into our um, thing. We also have NUE, um, Ocean Wide Project, as a member of our partnership. And I wanna really acknowledge, um, they've been working for the last few years. Um, NUE has approximately 2000 people. So I think all of NUE may be involved in the NUE's uh, Moana Mahu Marine Protected Area. So that's the approach that NUE has chosen to take. Um, which is obviously different than some of the other things that we're talking about. But it was just, um, it was announced internationally a couple of years ago and is now um, in legislation, uh, in regulation form in NUE. Um, and the next slide will show you kind of what that looks like. So that's, this is like a different approach um, again. Um, if we move on. To the next slide. Um, and I think I want to also talk to Hawaii's um, efforts. So Hawaii is um, basically, yeah, Hawaii is um, also has something called the Aloha Plus Challenge. So if you see that circle on the left hand side, that is Hawaii's response to the Micronesia Challenge to the um, to the Caribbean and also um, its engagement with the best approach. Um, and so this is another um, kind of local action to, to national uh, island level leadership to global level and very focused on S, uh, implementation of the sustainable development goals. But the thinking in Hawaii again is this linkage to um, what they're doing locally it is feeding upwards, not something feeding down. And I, um, and that's really critical. So here they actually have a dashboard in Hawaii that puts their marine, what they're committed themselves to in terms of marine managed areas. And you can um, see it. Um, I, I will share a link to the dashboard in a, in a minute. Uh, um, it's seen in context with their other um, sustainability goals. So marine isn't a thing that's being kind of done off by itself, but it's sort of linked together with the energy goals with, the, with their other goals that Hawaii is trying to um, undertake. And the graphic on the top left-hand side is really um, what I was talking a little bit to on this um, linkage between um, our kind of long history of, um, of trying to manage this space. So this is the ahupa, and basically this, what we would call ridge to reef um, management now. Oh, thank you, Michael, you just put the dashboard. Um, but so go and look in there and you'll see there's a lot of information um, specifically about the marine target. If we move to the next slide, I think, um, here, um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, to Hawaii community-based um, subsistence fisheries areas that are members of, um, that are implementing the Aloha Plus Challenge, actually won the Equator Prize last year. So, um, and we've been trying to kind of give some profile to that effort um, and make the connection between, again, the local to the global um, space. The next slide. And um, that, that was, I just quickly highlighted some things. I think it kind of builds very much on um, what Caroline was talking about, because I think there is, we're looking at the example of the um, engagement of political leaders more in, um, in, in that approach. And I think um, we need to look at how we connect that to kind of what some of these other approaches are so that, uh, this type of work is well supported. Um, and then I encourage people to um, check us out. Yeah, uh, and that's it. So we have a bunch of political leaders, a lot of islands and a lot of learning um, going on. Thank you. Excellent.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing those very diverse uh, national initiatives that are both very inspiring and, as you, you fairly stressed and underlined, relevant both at the local level but as well meaningful and powerful at the global level. So, likewise, I would like to open the floor for a few questions uh, and then maybe we will uh, enlarge the scope of the discussion in order to, to see how we could uh, again connect the dots and maybe foster further collaboration. Uh, as I indicated, we will have soon a new call for proposal for supporting um, European overseas countries and territories and definitely territories in the Pacific. But we have as well um, another regranting mechanism dedicated to Pacific states uh, called the Biopama Action Component. So there are many ways where we, we could see how we could uh, support further collaboration. Luca, please. So very good chat is uh, is very lively. Maybe one first question for you, Kate, is uh, in Palau. Um, how do they ensure compliance with no-take measures on uh, such a huge area? Yeah, I mean, I think they do have some problems there with um, the compliance. Um, there has been a lot of effort to look at um, what are, and I think there's been sharing also with New Caledonia on this, on um, how to monitor um, across that huge area. And I think also New Way has some of the same problems, but probably less pressure because of its location. So um, there, yeah, I, I can share more on that, um, but there's been like all sorts of offers of um, surveillance um, aircraft and um, things like that. But um, yeah, really difficult and not so easy. So they're trying, basically, is I think what I'll say. Other question, Luca? Yeah, maybe geographically speaking, another one um, from Elena. Um, what do they mean by marine managed areas in Hawaii? Because it seems like a few precisions are needed. Yeah, I think um, if you look at, if you go into their dashboard and you actually look at their target, so they have a target to increase marine management in Hawaii and um, they are tracking that by um, the percentage of Hawaii's marine waters under effective management. So this, uh, and then their, what, what they mean by that um, in terms of effective marine management is um, a suite of adaptive management approaches, sustainable use restoration, conservation measures, community-based management, time and area closures for fisheries replenishment, um, some legal things around sustainable fishing practices and effective enforcement, uh, systemized monitoring and the like. Um, so they have, I think, uh, in their measures, about 6% of their marine waters are under effective management and they're um, trying to increase that. So, but I encourage you to look at their dashboard because in the dashboard under that target, you'll see um, how they're tracking it, what they're tracking, um, where that information is coming from. Um, it's really comprehensive. What's impacting the marine space, um, the tourism uh, linkage, because obviously it's a tourism um, dependent uh, island. So check it out, it's great. Thank you. Maybe a last uh, question from the audience before we are uh, moving to, to a, a further dialogue between uh, speakers. Yes, okay. Um, I will give the answer, the question and the answer on behalf of Leticia who uh, had to, to leave unfortunately. There was a question on um, about the new management plan for the marine managed area in French Polynesia, whether it includes the LMMAs and the answer is uh, is no. So pretty straightforward because the zones are, are, too, uh, are too big, too large. Okay. So maybe food for, for thoughts. Thank you, thank you, Lucas. Thank you to all for your for your question. So, 
now I would like to to see how there could be connection, further collaboration between all these very interesting uh, initiatives and maybe something that could be uh, as well um, quite inspiring um, would be targeted to, to Kate. You, you fairly mentioned that um, even something at a single site uh, is not only meaningful at the local level, but uh, could be a, so powerful and interesting at the, at the global level. From your um, experience and exchange uh, with uh, island leaders, Actually, what is the recipe? What are the, the success factor for making this happening, for reaching out and being a kind of uh, eye opener? Yeah, I think um, some of it is around um, trusty, trust, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, in uh, the people that you're working with, that they're not going to, because uh, there are things that, um, don't work so well. I think the other is, um, particularly with political leaders, it's the peer group of political leaders working together um, and, and encouraging each other. Uh, it's, I think probably there's some similar, um, in that similar to what LMMA is doing, but with communities, but happening with political leaders. Uh, and then it's really thinking very strategically about what you're trying to achieve both <clears throat> for the the local site, for the local site's place in its in the island or in, at the national level, um, and then um, what that what that does um, at the international level. And there's like lots of different reasons that people want to do that. Um, sometimes it is about um, we have members that are engaged in our partnership because they're trying to get their political leaders um, to do things to better support what they're doing at a local level, um, and we also so. So that is um, really important. And I think it's having um, a set of partners that you trust to work with um, to kind of think about strategically what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. And then you figure out kind of who do I need to work with um, outside of my mm -hmm. space to actually achieve that. Good, good, thank you. And talking about championing, maybe I could ask to to Caroline, maybe to share more about uh, a story of uh, one uh, Wakatu champion. How does it work? Could you give us an example and how he, he actually navigate uh, through the LMMA network and have been able to, to mobilize pol politically? Yes, yeah, so interesting uh, that you're uh, raising this question, Carol, because um, um, I think I wanted, I need to um, to point that the Wakatu campaign that I, I presented is what LMMA um, uh, think, you know, that um, would be really interesting to develop further. But the Wakatu campaign was not led by the LMMA network. So for us, it's it's inspiring tools that we need to further develop under the current project we're doing. Um, but we have not um, we have not implemented this campaign, so I have no I don't know the champions that were um, part of it. But maybe I could. Um, there was a, a question earlier on about um, how some of this community-based work led to legislation, and I think I saw in the chat that I didn't address the question really well. And so, um, um, on that, um, when I presented the Worker to Campaign, I also presented on the Four Fiji Campaign. And uh, what's really interesting, I think, for you know the people to know <clears throat> this webinar is that it really started from uh, community concerns about you know the size of the group they were taking, the amount, and um, and um, people in Fiji they built um, you know this social campaign to, um, on on this uh, subject. And uh, so they got all these people to pledge that they wouldn't fish, they wouldn't consume uh, this fish. And, and it's really interesting because it got the Fiji government to legislate on the, on the, the ban of the grouper. 
um, so it's, it's really interesting because this really led to a new legislation mm -hmm. and the legislation that was really accepted because it came from the bottom the same one without the this um, social media campaign would have been the I mean it wouldn't have been accepted uh, the way it was so um, so that was uh, I think an interesting example Sure, a great example of political uptake uh, with uh, exactly yeah. the Bottom Up Initiative. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> when you mentioned um, that um, the Wakatu campaign uh, to be further developed, uh, what could be the need? How our our different uh, initiative or network could could help actually? Well, what what we are. Um what we'll be doing you know as part of our project is to um, so most of the partner will train community champions um, but I think what will be really important is that we develop information strategies so I think it would be um, um, it wouldn't be coherent for me to tell you oh we are going we all need to develop this tool and this tool in this country because first we're going to be listening to what people need sure. what are the information need and that's our first step in the country where we'll be working so i can't tell you now what we'll be developing we'll be listening first and developing mm -hmm. strategies and then implementing them um so yeah so we'll be developing you know this sort of tools but also you know radio program the real challenge is really to uh, to reach communities because the information you know it's one thing to develop really fancy type of information but how really remote communities of the pacific can access this information is one of the biggest challenge mm -hmm. sorry to carol to interrupt you here and uh, I don't want to be boring, but I'm afraid we will need to move to the uh, concluding remarks. We are getting there smoothly, but surely. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So definitely we got already a um, great um, example of um, marine solution. Uh, as I indicated, it was the first online event of this uh, uh, journey to Marseille and Vital Sites. We will be definitely delighted to organize another one. Uh, so please stay tuned and uh, we will probably meet uh, soon by the end of, of the year. Um, the point was to promote uh, diverse initiatives, but as well as I indicated already, was to connecting people, to connecting experience, to share ideas and to, to see if there could be a way to further collaborate. So I hope this uh, event has been uh, of any interest for all the audience and for the, for the speakers. In any case, uh, please feel free to contact us. Please let us know if you would like to further collaborate uh, with one another uh, and if we could be of uh, any help. That would be uh, that would be great for us uh, since we wanted to to organize a kind of um, uh, way to help people to to meet uh, through the ocean through the this largest uh, ocean. Thank you again to all the the great speakers. We have been more than happy to to have you all. Uh, thank you to the uh, to the audience. Maybe I would like to let uh, Cecile, my colleague, to, to give as well a few final words about uh, how Panorama could uh, further help. But on my behalf and behalf of the best team, a big thank you again. And I hope to see you soon and maybe in Marseille. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Yes, actually, uh, listening to all your experience and what you are doing, I think there is definitely a way for, for publishing on Panorama platform. So it's also a way to, to share what you've done, your good practices with, with a wider uh, audience, with people that you may not know or not be in contact. Uh, so like that. Um, for Panorama, it's, it's not so much about the whole project, but uh, you have a lot of elements 
in your projects that you could really feature and, and focus on, even like what you mentioned, a successful campaign, because we know exactly how, as you said, it's really difficult to reach um, people, especially when they are very uh, in remote places and, and far apart. So maybe you can share how to build a campaign that reach to the to 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 these people, and it can be already a solution. So this this is uh, the idea. Uh, I also would like to thank you all, our guests and um, our the audience who joined us today. And I hope we'll be following uh, with the with new partnership and collaboration. Thank you. Great. So see you soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank